Well, I already told you that uh, this was a hard week. And uh, part of the reason why I, I want you to know that is because this was one of those weeks, and I can say in lots of years now of preaching, um, it was one of those weeks, I haven't had very many, where I, I could not pull it together. I just couldn't. Um, multiple days in a row, um, I think I was thinking so much about, about particularly the real family with Lee passing away at 26 years old. Um, you know, yeah, uh, just a week ago, Sunday morning. And, uh, and so I was just really, I was just, I was really down about that, let's be very honest. And so when I tried to work on my message this week, I just I couldn't do it. It was hard. And so um, I would just pray and go for a walk and try to, I don't know, live into that, pray into that. I'm telling you all this because, of course, um, I do, I, you know I do my best to uh, prepare my messages best I can. But I, I will tell you that I got a lot of notes there, but wow, let's hope, Holy Spirit, you'll make sense of them. Uh, because I didn't feel as prepared as I normally do. Uh, I'm excited about this summer series, though. I really am. I'm excited for us to look for the summer at who is the Holy Spirit. And um, as I was reflecting this week and trying to pray and think and pull something together, the question that really began to emerge for me is, why would the Holy Spirit even come? Um, and maybe that was because, uh, you know, when you think of all the difficulty and the darkness and the chaos and the trouble, you think, Holy Spirit, like what? Why would you even bother um, with us or with things? Um, and, and yet that question kept coming around to me. And what, of course, many of you know, and we know collectively that the Holy Spirit comes because our triune God actually wants to be with us, more than with us, in us. But somehow, God wants to enjoy his life in union with our lives. And that our days, the days that we've been given now and for eternity by the gift of Jesus Christ, is, a, is really an expression of God's desire to participate in life with us, to be with us and in us as we are with him and in him. And that was what I was reflecting on this week uh, in the midst of prayer and feeling pretty low. There was a sense in which God was saying, I want to be with you. I want to be with my people. I want to be in you. And so I want to look at you. You know, when the Holy Spirit did come to live in people in Pente on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, he really came with a bang, didn't he? I like to think of it as uh, the Holy Spirit the triune God had been looking forward to this moment for such a long time, and now it was finally here, and he was eager to make his presence known. In Acts chapter 2, we hear these words, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues, as the Spirit enabled them. It's like, boom, God is in the house. And the house is shaking, right? And the listening streets noticed the sound. No noise bylaws were being broken, I'm sure. And people were confused by what they were hearing. And what is so interesting about this, they weren't confused because they couldn't understand what was happening. They were confused because they could understand, but they couldn't understand how they could be understanding what they're hearing, right? Because it says, now they were in, you know, staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation out of heaven. They had come there for the, the festivals. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because, because, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? I always, I always insert there in my mind. I, think, I, I was raised in northern Alberta. North Galileans, Northern Albertans, they sort of have a resonance. <laughs> and I always think, aren't all these speaking Northern Albertans? Um, 
You, you feel me? Okay. Then, then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? And then lists a bunch of them, Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya, near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans, and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. And so Peter, of course, uh, the same Peter who had just denied even knowing Jesus a few days before, stands up and explains that what they're actually seeing and hearing and witnessing, wondering about is proof positive that the Jesus who died, who'd been put to death, had actually risen from the dead. And after ascending to the right hand of the Father, was now pouring out his Holy Spirit on his people. And so what they're hearing is evidence of that. And what Jesus was doing among them fulfilled a whole bunch of prophecies about God coming to his people. And Peter picks one from the prophet Joel. He says, oh, these people aren't drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. Come on, people. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And then he quotes him. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs in the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood. This is an earth-shaking, heavens-shaking experience before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The Holy Spirit had finally come. And when he did, it was like a dam bursting in. It's like God's heart, his constant desire, his epic plan was finally unleashed on the world. And everyone noticed. Well, at least within a few block radius. But the ripples went out from there. But this plan, which had finally come to fruition on the day of Pentecost, this plan that God would come into his people, not just a few here and there, but all his people, men, women, young, old, this was a plan that had been a long, long time coming. God had been preparing for this moment for a long, long time. So let's back up for a moment. We looked last week when we started at how the Father and the Son and the Spirit formed and filled this world, as well as formed and filled human images of God. How the Holy Spirit, the giver of life, hovered over the world and continues to hover over this world in order to bring God's flourishing plans to fruition. But if we've heard the story before, which I think most of us have, the plans of God were frustrated by human mistrust, human rebellion. Instead of living by the spirit that they had been given, humans turned away from God's grace, rejected God's ways, and the result was devastating. Violence, idolatry, abuse, destruction, judgment. God got to the point, only a few chapters in, where he was actually sorry that he even made humans in the first place. But he didn't give up. God pivoted in his plan in order to pursue his bigger plan all along, and he began to draw people to himself through whom he would bring the rest of his world, his humans, back to his original desire, back to the purpose for which he had made the world and humans in the first place. And so we started to narrow his focus. This is what happens in Genesis. If you read Genesis 1 through 11, Tower of Babel, all the confusing of languages, which is remedied on Acts 2. Uh, God uh, looks at all the nations, and then he begins to narrow his focus down from the whole world down to one family, one man, and promises to do through this one man, this one family, something that would, in time, reverse the tide of violence and destruction and bring life back to the world. God made a special covenant with Abram, promising to bless him, and through him to bless every other family in the world. And it's to that family 
that we see the Holy Spirit start showing up. Start coming on someone there. Oh, and then that guy over there. Him? Yes, him. <laughs> and, and then there's a special anointing given to a prophet during this era, or maybe a king during that generation, or a deliverer during a particularly dark period of time. When we hear the whole story of God's chosen people, the Jewish family of Abram, Abraham, his name got lengthened later, we begin to notice the Holy Spirit is at work, hovering, and then in sort of fits and starts, sometimes in ways we can't even completely understand with purposes that aren't always obvious to us, and yet working toward a goal that God has. God seems to be pursuing patiently, slowly, gradually, but inexorably, relentlessly. He starts to form a people so he could fill them. It's like the Holy Spirit who was hovering over the chaos of the world at the beginning is now hovering over, brooding over in order to breathe into a new people. It's really interesting in the scripture that the very first people to be described as filled with the Spirit of God are who? You Bible scholars? Who are the first people? Craftsman. Remember his name? None of you named your kids this, I bet. The Lord said to Moses, this is in Exodus 31, See, I have chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Ur, of the tribe of Judah. Listen to this. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, and with all kinds of skills to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of crafts. Moreover, I have appointed Aholiab, son of... I have new glasses coming this week. Ahissamach, of the tribe of Dan, to help him. And, and, and this is the forming of the tabernacle, which was designed to be a place where God would come and dwell among his people. A holy place, a holy uh, tent. Later, the temple was built for the same purposes. But these initial craftsmen were the first mention of the spirit being given, filling someone. Isn't it interesting that it's so that they could form a place where God would live among his people. That is not a coincidence. It goes on from there. If you've been reading the Bible in one year, or if you've been reading the story of God's people lately, you'll notice that it seems like here and there, the Holy Spirit just shows up. Um, I chose a few of them for us, just so we kind of heard it. Um, uh, one of the famous ones, of course, was d various deliverers, various judges or deliverers, you could call them. And so I picked the famous strong guy, Samson. How's this? Uh, Samson went down to Timnah together with his mother and father. There was somebody he wanted there. As they approached the vineyards of Timnah, suddenly a young lion came roaring toward him. The spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him so that he tore the lion apart with his bare hands as he might have torn a young goat. Have you torn a young goat lately? I haven't, but apparently he could tear a young goat. <laughs> and this lion was just like that. But he didn't tell his mom or dad about it. <clears throat> then he went down and talked with the woman. He liked her. I don't think that's part of the spirit filling him. But yeah, something else. Uh, a little later... Uh, in, in 15, where he gets tricked uh, by some folks um, and they want to turn him over to the Philistines because the Philistines are mad at him because he's, well, wreaking havoc. He says, we've come to tie you up and hand you over to the Philistines. Samson said, swear to me that you won't kill me yourselves. Agreed, they answered. We'll only tie you up and hand you over to them. We will not kill you. So they bound him with two new ropes and led him up from the rock. As he approached Lehi, the Philistines came toward him shouting, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. The ropes in his arms became like charred flax and the bindings dropped from his hands. Finding a fresh jawbone of a donkey, <laughs> he grabbed it and struck down a thousand men. I'm just sorry. Tearing young goats, jawbones of donkeys. 
It is a different world. The Spirit of God comes on Samson, and when every little boy who grew up in the church reading these stories, you're like, why can't he come on me like that? I want to, I want to, I want that. Anyway, uh, the deliverers would get their share of the Spirit here and there, come and go, in order to lead and empower them to deliver God's people, particularly when they were being trounced on by others. Uh, another another uh, example is, of course, uh, kings. And this is a really profound example because it's an example with Saul, King Saul, the very first king um, of, of Israel, and then the second king, David. It, it actually describes the transfer, which is a, a, a tricky bit, right? Because when we read the Old Testament, um, we notice the Holy Spirit doesn't always stick around. And so uh, listen to this. Remind myself where I'm at here. 16, I'm um, in 1 Samuel 16, uh, 13 and 14. Um, backing up slightly to 12. The Lord uh, says to Samuel, rise and anoint this one. This, this is the one, David. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, David, in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. He also was kind of strong because of that too, right? Remember Goliath, bears, lions. Um, anyway, not in this case. But uh, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully on David and Samuel then went to Ramah. Next verse. Now the spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul. And an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. Dun, dun, dun. There's more to that story. But it's an example of the Holy Spirit coming powerfully on one, but actually leaving another, empowering a king, but then retracting and moving to another as he struggled to find a worthy king for his people. Another example is a priest. I thought I'd just show you a few examples here. I, I know some of you are like, this is old hat, but for some of you, this is new. And so um, here's an example of a priest in Second Chronicles. And just as evidence that the spirit of God coming on someone doesn't always mean good things. This is from Second Chronicles 24, verse 20. Then the Spirit of God came on Zechariah, son of Jehodi, the priest. So you would have been a priest too. He stood before the people and said, This is what God says. Why do you disobey the Lord's commands? You will not prosper. Because you have forsaken the Lord, he has forsaken you. But they plotted against him. And by order of the king, they stoned him to death in the courtyard of the Lord's temple. Filled and then stoned. It goes on from there. There's prophets. Um, I, won't, I won't read it to you, but there's, there's examples of different prophets. Ezekiel's a great one. Constantly being filled or led or brought up or put down or moved somewhere by the Holy Spirit in order to speak God's word to his people. So we have all these different actions that are being taken. The Holy Spirit is coming on people in order to help them deliver or to lead or to mediate or to, or to speak God's word to them or to confront them with God's word, even if they paid the price for it all the way down through the story of God's people, the Holy Spirit is coming, but not consistently. There seem to be big periods of time where it's like, not a lot happening. But he's there, brooding, you could say, hovering, working, forming, moving toward God's goal. At the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, we see a flurry of activity again as the Holy Spirit shows up and begins to enact God's plan, specifically in this family. We have Elizabeth, another Zechariah, who also was a priest. Uh, we have little examples in Luke chapter 1. Uh, let's see this. In verse 41, we're told that when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, Mary, cousin, already pregnant with Jesus, comes, uh, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and in a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. A little later on, Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, he too, in verse uh, 67, his father, uh, John the Baptist's father, was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he prophesied, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. 
the Holy Spirit starts showing up in force as Jesus is coming on the scene. And then the Gospel of Luke is famous for this. He really follows up with Jesus himself not only being conceived of the Holy Spirit, of course, Mary being conceived of the Holy Spirit, but being a fully empowered son of God, fully human, fully God, but filled with the Spirit of God to be with us. And so in Luke chapter 4, we're told that Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. Having succeeded, over in verse 14 of chapter 4, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit at work, brooding to bring about God's plan all along that he would form a people in which he could dwell. Now, these prophecies have been given all the way through the covenant. And some of the big famous prophets like Jeremiah promised a new covenant coming that would be written on the hearts of God's people. Ezekiel himself declared the promise in Ezekiel 36. He said, I, God, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I'll put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. And then there's many others. Peter picked Joel, the prophecy we already heard him reiterate on the day of Pentecost. We hop, we skip, we see the Holy Spirit surge and then almost withdraw, but cascading down through the generations of God's people, all the while forming and preparing and urging and compelling, making for himself a people through whom he would bless the whole world. And the Holy Spirit is central to all of it central to the coming of Jesus, empowering his ministry, raising him from the dead. And then after Jesus left, saying he had to leave in order for the Spirit to come again, the Holy Spirit comes as a gift from the Father and the Spirit. And all of it for what? Why would the Holy Spirit come? For one purpose, to be in us. We heard it read, Tenille read it at the beginning, that beautiful passage in Ephesians chapter 2, where Paul's reflecting on how all of these, in the particular church he's speaking to, these Ephesian Christians, most of them were not part of the covenant people of God originally. They weren't part of the the Abrahamic faith. They, they They were Gentiles. They were outsiders. And yet, through Jesus... God had brought together those who were far away and those who were near, those who were circumcised and those who were not. He had torn down that wall that had kept them apart, making peace through the cross. And then saying, through him, Jesus, we both, and he's referring to Jew and Gentile, have access to the Father by one spirit. And then that, those, that closing chunk is so powerful Verse 19 of Ephesians chapter 2, consequently, because of all this, because of what Jesus has done, because of what the Spirit is doing, you are no longer, remember he's speaking to outsiders, speaking to people who would have never been considered part of the family of God. You are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundations of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. And then here it is, he's coming to the clincher. In him, Jesus, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. This is what God was planning all along. This is why he's so keen to include others. I struggled with exactly how to capture this. And I kept wanting to say, well, the Holy Spirit first included everyone and then dwelt in them. That's true. But his purpose was always to be in union with humans. That God made us for union with himself. Communion, relationship, all that stuff. What he does is he solves our fragmentation problem. He solves the alienation we had between him, but also each other, 
so that all flesh, as we see captured in Joel's prophecy, all flesh would be a dwelling place of God's spirit. God made you and he made me. He made us for himself. It is astonishing to think that all that God was doing down through the generations and generations, reading the Old Testament story of God's people is disheartening. What I mean by that is, you, there's times you're just like, please stop, get it right. I know that's what I'm sure our great cloud of witnesses is saying to us too. <clears throat> but you read it and you think, oh, please. But what you begin to see is that God is bound and determined. He's going to make it happen. And he does. He comes to us to be with us through Jesus Christ. And then through the work of the Son, in bringing us all back together, he then comes to us to unify himself, to be in union with us, to be one with us by the Holy Spirit. He forms us and he fills us. Why would he come? When it comes right down to it, because he wants to be in you and in me. I don't really grasp what that means. <laughs> I mean, all that that entails is beyond me. But I accept the truth of it because I can see this is what God was doing all along. And how that practically challenges me and I think all of us is to realize that each day given to us is a day in which we get to live into God's full enjoyment, God's biggest plan, God's complete and total purpose for creation and for the creation of humanity is so that he can enjoy life with you, with us, not just us, us. Does that ever give a different shape to the way we think about our lives? the way you think about history, the future, the plans and goals that we have and pursue. The prophets talk about the day coming when the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. That happens by the Spirit who comes, who floods, who fills, renews, transforms and brings us into union with God himself through the work of Jesus. Yesterday, I lugged myself to the top of Mount Thompson. <laughs> and I only face-planted once coming down. It was a near miss about six other times, but... But man, are you rewarded by some great views. Hang glider point, and then all along, and then get up to the top. To look at this valley, and to see it as a place that God created for himself. Filled with people that God created for himself. That the God of the universe has worked for generations, millennia, so that on this day, July 10th, 2002, 2022, <laughs> he could be with us and in us. And in the midst of difficulty, as I already said today, that filled my heart and mind with a great sense of peace, of honor, of wonder, that God would look at us in our mess and say, I want to be with you. I've come to be in you. That's what makes all the difference. And it really helped me this week. 
but I think it helps us each and every day. And so my hope and prayer for all of us as we continue to just wake up each morning, that we would know that this is a day, not only that God has made, but he's made it so that he can live life in us and with us. So that we can enjoy him and experience his goodness and his grace.